Enjoy. The land between the lakes where there's, you know, dogman activity. They've had the Bigfoot activity. They have the goblins, the gigantic cave system, the mammoth cave system. I heard that that actually stretches all the way up into New York. But the Aztecs might have made it all the way up to Utah here in Pennsylvania that on Google Maps is called the China Wall. They say that it was formed millions of years ago when the continent shifted, the bedrock of the ocean shot up and created this long wall. I mean, dude, I'm telling you, this wall is at points that I was standing, I climbed it. it. At points it was like 50 feet, 100 feet high, and there, it was in sections. Like somebody like picked up these giant boulders and stacked them on top of each other. The boulders on top of each other, you can see straight through. Like they're two separate pieces. And there's, there's, there's tons of that kind of stuff all over this country. There's a point to a history of us and this country that doesn't go with the history books you're manipulating the kids with. Then in Texas, there's another place in Texas, I forget the name of it, but I think it's like an 18 mile long wall that's underground. And there has been this one guy who paid to have it, parts of it excavated. There's another place, Mayan ruins that are in Georgia. Government has that locked down. You can't visit it. The story that took is taking me to Kentucky. I'm going to Kentucky because this guy, when he was 15 years old, about 15, 20 years ago now, he went out raccoon hunting with his grandfather, these creatures on four legs, and he actually saw this thing stand up on its hind legs and pursue him. And so what these things are, I don't know. Now, my guest Kyle believes that these are natural animals. He, he grew up in Kentucky where he's not the only one who's, as he got older, he found out that these things are being seen in Kentucky. And the old timers, like his grandfather, called them slewfoots. And in an old blues, bluesgrass song, uh, it's called Slewfoot something, they're describing a bear, according to the lyrics, that runs 90 miles an hour, jumps 30 feet, does all these like supernatural things. And so when his grandfather would say slewfoot as a kid, he thought it was a bear. But it turns out that the lyrics to that song were changed over time. At one time, the bear in the story was a wolf man. I'll be in Kentucky hunting the dog man the first week of October. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get into that right away. Kentucky, there's this really interesting area called the Penny Royal. Have you spoken to anybody in that area or know anything about the Penny Royal legend? I know there's a whole I, podcast called Penny Royal. Yeah. And I, I listened to that podcast because a lot of people were telling me it had a lot of uh, parallels to mm. a series on YouTube called Hellier. And so I, I listened to that podcast a long time ago, but that was all like news to me when I was listening to it. What, I, what I've come to understand, though, through the Hellier crew, Penny Royal, and then the people that I talk to that are in Kentucky, Kentucky is a bizarre place, man. Like going back to like over 100 years ago, if you ever heard of the, the meat storm that happened there where the, the, like, I, I get these people said that meat just literally fell from the sky, like for, a, a, I think it was like an hour or two, like just, it was like a meat shower. Right. And, and the one guy I had on my show, who's, who's the reason why I was, I'm even going to Kentucky to begin with. He told me that, that that's a true story. And the, I guess his family was one of the people that went through all that. I mean, it was his lineage right. and so he, he's been rooted in Kentucky for, you know, centuries, him and his family. It's been really interesting finding out more and more about Kentucky. They got the the LBL, which is real famous, the land between the lakes, where there's you know dogman activity. They've had the Bigfoot activity. They have the goblins, the gigantic cave system, the mammoth cave system. I heard that that actually stretches all the way up into New York. And so, I mean, when you when you go down the road of like hollow earth and the idea of hollow earth, people are like I have a hard time believing. Like, do you do you know? Do you ever hear of these things called caves? I mean. The, the earth is hollow to a certain extent, at least. So right. could things be, you know, living in those caves? Well, sure, because man has lived in caves. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I, I just, I find Kentucky extremely interesting. And there's this guy that was on my show and he had uh, one of the most terrifying dog man encounters I've ever heard in my life. I told him I'm coming down. He said it was okay. And uh, I, I'm going down there and I'm going to go to the location that this happened at where he was attacked by this thing and he was actually saved by his hunting dog. This happened when he was 15 
and he's never been back to the location before. He's going to take me there. He said he will not stay out there at night. He has been begging me not to camp there. I'm just like, well, I'm there to see this thing and have, have this experience and maybe even, you know, come home with a head. And so I, I, he, he's been asking me if we, we would just at least consider staying in our trucks. So I'll consider it. We'll see how it goes. I mean, I'm, I, I don't typically get a whole lot of like nerves going into the woods, but knowing what happened at this location, according to this guy, I was, I, I'm a little nervous. I really am. So we'll, we'll see what happens, but it's in the Daniel Boone National Forest. And just, it's one of those places, man, Kentucky. I, I freaking love Kentucky. I'm in the Philly area. And uh, me and my wife have been talking about possibly moving out of state and uh, I'm not going to Kentucky. I might go to like East Tennessee, which is right near Kentucky. So wow. Yeah. My girlfriend and I went to Philly, certainly yeah. hotbed for mysterious energy. I mean, we met up with a fellow truth seeker, author, Ross Ben, who is very much in tune with. Wissahickon Creek and Philly and that particular Germantown area. And he describes Philly as a haunt, you know, so it's no coincidence to me that you're, you know, one of the biggest paranormal podcasters and you're based out of Philadelphia. I mean, this place is an energetic magnet for this type of stuff. So you just look at the history of Philadelphia. And I mean, there, there's so much baggage that comes along throughout the existence of our country that is mm. percolating around Philadelphia, there's an old fort called uh, Fort Mifflin right off the Delaware River. It, it's really underfunded. It, it's, you know, a tourist, quote unquote, tourist attraction that doesn't have much funding from the government. And so they're just fighting to stay open. But I started looking into the area and, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of treasure hunting. And there's about six, seven treasure lures in Pennsylvania that are treasures that supposedly were never found. And, you know, I, one day I was just kind of like browsing around the internet, trying to, you know, maybe find my next place to visit and make a video and stuff. And I, I want to do treasure hunting. Well, I, I, I forget how I came across it, but Fort Mifflin and I started looking at Fort Mifflin for a few days and I was like, you know what? I bet there's tons of artifacts there that haven't even been found because recently, I think just in the last year or two, they found an entire underground cavern in the fort that they didn't even know was there. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody was mowing the lawn and it kind of like dipped down hard and they dug it up. And it was an old chamber where they, um, I guess even in the Civil War, they put prisoners in there, but they filled it in. People forgot it was even there and it was per it's perfectly preserved. I mean, the wood isn't rotted, nothing. It was, it was, it's beautiful. And so I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, if they just found that just a year or two ago, then who knows what could be there. And so I started looking into the history of Fort Mifflin. During the Revolutionary War, uh, the British had actually started the construction of this fort. And then they abandoned the project because the land that was, they were building on was not ideal. It was very sandy. And so the Americans came in afterwards and finished the building of the fort. And the, the location, as far as um, strategy goes, was perfect because you had the Delaware river right there. And it was like, it's not like this anymore, but at the time it was like an Island, the river kind of went around it. And so they, they built the fort and there was a battle there for, I believe five weeks. And the British ships came up the Delaware river and they were just hammering this fort for about five weeks. The last week for five days straight, they just rapid fire on this one location on the fort to blow the doors off. Eventually the Americans, they, they let the flag running to make it look like they were still there, but they evacuated at night and got out. But I, I started thinking to myself, okay, so there's probably a lot of, you know, cannonballs, things like that, that have never been found there. Also, what the Americans did do to prevent the ships from coming too close is they built like 30 by 30 foot boxes of wood and they filled it with about, I think it was like 20 or 30,000 pounds of rocks. And so there's these big rocks or wooden boxes with rocks in that they sunk in the bottom of the river and they had these poles coming out with spikes on the end so that the ships could get hung up on that and they couldn't go a certain distance to the, to the fort. And so I'm thinking, okay, that gives me like a perimeter of where we, we search because how far do cannonballs fire from back then? So I started 